Hello, welcome to the Tuesday, June 5th, 2018 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Augusta, Georgia. Rob today took a closer look at Authenticode, Microsoft's long-standing standard to sign executable code. In particular, Rob looked at how feasible it is to restrict execution to signed code only. Rob put together some neat scripts to enumerate all executables, summarizing the certificates used and also the certificate authorities used to sign these certificates and to look at unsigned code, of course, as well to figure out if any unsigned binaries are important in the daily use of Windows and products like Office. One interesting find, the copy of Windows 10 Rob investigated actually included one legitimate binary that was verified using a test certificate authority. But he also found a number of unsigned files. For example, part of the Hyper-V system appears to be unsigned, which is particularly troubling given the importance uh, this Hyper-V subsystem has in some of the newer security restrictions on Windows. Given the fact that numerous Microsoft Office files as well as Windows operating system components are not signed, it turns out to be a little bit more difficult than expected to restrict Windows 10 to execute signed code only. Take a look at his post if you are interested in this technique and his scripts or if you have any experiences to share. One reader pointed out that just-in-time compiled .NET applications are also a challenge when it comes to executing signed code only. And a cyber risk company, Kenna Security, reminds all organizations using Google's G Suite to review their Google groups. Apparently, administrators do not quite understand the privacy settings for the corporate version of Google groups. As Kenna discovered, uh, groups are supposed to be for internal use only, are often configured to be visible to anybody from the internet. Part of the misunderstanding may be how these groups are used by companies. Often these groups are used to implement email distribution lists. A set of company users is added to a mailing list, which the intention is to then only forward email to this particular group of users. But uh, whenever you set up something like this, there is then also a web-based version of this list, essentially a discussion forum. This is enabled automatically via Google Groups. If an administrator makes the list public, the content of the web-based forum is exposed to everybody able to reach a particular URL, which is actually pretty easily guessable if you know the domain name the organization uses with Google, which of course is pretty much public. I think part of the problem here is really sort of that you know people intend to set up a mailing list, but then what they actually get is a discussion forum, a web-based forum, and uh, when they're providing sort of public access to the list, what they really think happens is that now the public is able to send email to this particular email alias they set up. They don't realize that as a side effect, they also make this discussion list public. Now, this issue isn't really new in I feel if you really carefully read the instructions for this feature, it should be clear what's happening. But Kenna, again, you know, they took a look at these groups, they scanned some of them and found that there are numerous examples of bad configurations. Now we know for a while that existing key exchange and signature algorithms can be broken pretty quickly using quantum computing. Now at this point, quantum computing isn't quite up there yet, where an attack like this would actually be practical, but we are rapidly approaching the point where existing key exchange algorithms should probably be considered insecure. Now to defend against this threat, we actually then have to switch to different algorithms that were particularly designed to be not vulnerable to common attacks that could be launched using quantum computers. 
So far, these algorithms exist, but uh, there hasn't really been done a lot of work to actually make them sort of practical and implement them. Microsoft now came to the rescue and released a fork of OpenVPN, the popular VPN software that actually uses two quantum resistant uh, key exchange protocols, Frodo and Psyche, and also Picnic, a safe signature algorithm. Now, this fork of OpenVPN does rely on a specific fork of the OpenSSL library that actually implements these algorithms, but Microsoft went way beyond of actually just releasing the code. They actually also released instructions on how to, for example, set up an OpenVPN gateway on a Raspberry Pi in order to support this new software. So this post quantum crypto VPN as Microsoft called it or PQ crypto VPN can run on Linux and on Windows. Well, that's it for today. So thanks for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.